Uh, it gives me great pleasure to welcome one of our distinguished alumnus, Dr. Raghuram Rajan. He, to us, he represents someone who is extremely special in the sense, of course, he is an alumnus, he is also a distinguished alumnus, he is also a faculty member, but unlike many of our faculty members, unlike many of us who who are teaching and preaching, he has also walked the talk and he's been the, he's headed, he's been the governor of the Reserve Bank of India. And without saying too much, I would just like to say that we are delighted to have you here with us. And you know this, uh, whatever we could hold in the Rogra Hall, we have managed, there are others who are, seeing this online. So we are delighted that you spared time for us and we hope that you would continue to come back to our alma mater and we look forward to hearing your talk and getting the benefit of your advice to take IIT Delhi forward. Thank you. So there's actually two housekeeping announcements. One is that uh, we'd like Professor Banerjee, who is going away very quickly, to present him the memento as a token of our appreciation. Uh, the other is that you've all received a link to the form if you want to ask questions. Depending on the time, we will try to pass them on to him, but you need to put them online. Okay? So with that. So thank you very much, honorable director, distinguished professors, guests, and, uh, and friends. Uh, it certainly is an honor to be invited back to speak to all of you. Now, I could spend uh, hours here reminiscing about the years I spent at IIT Delhi. They were some of the happiest years of my life, but uh, we don't have an hour. So let me quickly jump into my talk. I'm going to talk about liberal democracy and India's growth. Uh, these seem like two disconnected topics. I will argue they're intimately related. There are some who argue that democracy holds back India's growth and development, that India needs strong, even authoritarian leadership with few checks and balances on it to progress. Even while protesting that they don't want to be like China, that is their model, emphasizing the production of goods and capital, not ideas and human capabilities. China has already seen the limits of that model. We need a truly Indian way, and I'm going to make the case that that Indian way has democracy centrally in it. Now, let me start with a couple of slides. Uh, you know, take a look at this. Uh, what is fascinating about India's growth in the last few decades, as this chart from a recent working paper by Fan, Peters, and Zilliborty suggests, is the extent to which Indian job growth has been in services and construction, drawing people out of agriculture. Yes, agriculture is still the biggest employer, but people have come, been coming out of it, and they've been coming out of it into services and construction, not into manufacturing. Manufacturing has been relatively stagnant as a share of Indian employment. Also, if you look within services, most of the job creation is in consumer services, such as in retail, hotels, restaurants, and leisure. Leisure means cinema halls, and so on. These are services that are typically produced by small firms. They're also producer services, like IT, design, finance, legal, and consulting. I mean, think of the uh, private banks, think of uh, the IT companies. These are all uh, services provided by firms that sell to other firms and are probably j the jobs that many of you will take uh, because they require skills and pay very well. These two are growing incredibly fast, but employ a small, 
though fast growing share of the population today. Now, interestingly, rural areas have benefited less from job growth in consumer services and probably even less from producer services. So that's an issue that these are services that largely show up in the urban areas. Um, let me then go to why this is important. It is important because it does suggest that as far as India's growth goes thus far, we've not had a lot of success in manufacturing. We've had a lot more success in consumer services and, con and producer services and consumption. Now, have we missed the manufacturing bus altogether? And the answer is not quite. Uh, we do have a strong global presence in certain areas like two-wheelers, we're the world's largest producer of two-wheelers, in pharmaceuticals where uh, uh, we do have a large presence. But these are areas where we have strong domestic demand, but also skills like R&D are very important, where people like you will be very important in, in, in value added. Where we do much less well is in moderately skilled manufacturing, where strong logistics and transport, uh, adequate availability of power, ease of doing business, and a decently educated but docile labor force is available. Unfortunately, these are where the bulk of the manufacturing jobs are. So the question then comes, why have we not done so well in manufacturing while authoritarian countries like China and Vietnam are succeeding in, in expanding significantly? Now there you have to acknowledge that on the positive side, communist countries emphasize primary and secondary education much more than India did and have large numbers of, you know, moderately educated workers. Moreover, when it comes to things like infrastructure, the availability of utilities and so on, their ability to acquire land easily and build out infrastructure has been significant. Now in a democracy like ours, it's much more difficult. A uh, couple of examples, China built tens of thousands of miles of high-speed rail while we are struggling to complete the Mumbai Ahmedabad demonstration project many years after it was announced. Now, that's not a coincidence. It has been hard to acquire the land for the fast uh, connection between Mumbai and Ahmedabad. But that uh, epitomizes a larger problem. We're not an authoritarian country. It is not that easy for us to acquire land. And therefore, building out the infrastructure is much harder for us. In fact, all it takes in a democracy like ours is a voice like Lata Mangeshkar's, melodious as it may be, to torpedo key infrastructure like the Pedal Road flyover. Now, those of you who remember, one of the big reasons we didn't get it was Lata Mangeshkar and Asha Bonsley uh, sort of opposed the construction of that. Now, I don't want to take sides here and say who was right or who was wrong, but the broader point is it's much harder in a democracy to build out infrastructure. Moreover, authoritarian governments overcome bureaucratic environments. They have bureaucratic environments just like us, but they overcome it by opening doors to chosen businesses. My colleague at the University of Chicago, Chiang Tai-she, argues that crony capitalism has been a key feature in China's strong growth, that uh, officials open the doors to their favorite businesses within their, their states. And equally important has been the suppression of labor unions and labor activism. China grew by limiting wage growth below productivity, thus giving businesses a comparative advantage in exports. So these are ways the authoritarian countries have succeeded. And the question we have to ask ourselves is, is that path open to India uh, if it wants to create a strong manufacturing sector? India certainly needs to do far more on primary and secondary education, whatever growth path we choose. Uh, as you know, ASER, uh, which is an affiliate of Pratham, does these annual rankings of where our education stands, and they don't make for, uh, you know, uh, for happy reading. We are, uh, in many ways, uh, not giving our kids, by and large, a good education, of course, 
Many of you have not had that experience. You've had fantastic educations. You're getting a fantastic education at IIT Delhi, but um, a lot of people uh, uh, don't get uh, decent education. One example is simply on the PISA assessment of where we stand internationally. We participated once, and we did so badly, we decided not to participate again. So that suggests that we need to do far more on education, and we are. We are. Uh, there are lots of initiatives in the states, but we have a long way to go to get a creditable workforce which can do the kind of work which is involved in a reasonable uh, uh, section of manufacturing. Now, again, uh, infrastructure. Yes, we are building out infrastructure. The government has a strong infrastructure program. But again, we have a long way to go to match the kind of infrastructure that exists in some of our competitors. And of course, as far as crony capitalism goes, or uh, the uh, repression of labor, clearly those are not areas we want to go to as a democratic country. Now, uh, you know, the government recognizes this and has been trying to offer nudges for manufacturing through a variety of production-linked uh, incentives, but also by increasing tariffs on, uh, on imports. Now, I have written extensively about this elsewhere, so I won't repeat arguments. But I will uh, make the following point, that the entire PLI scheme uh, of the government, even if it succeeds according to the government's wishes, will create about 0.6 crore jobs. 0.6 crore jobs is just a drop in the ocean of the number of jobs we need in this country going forward. And thus far, we see that the scheme hasn't even produced the kind of jobs that were advertised. 15% of the investment in the scheme has taken place. We've had about 3% of the jobs that, uh, that were scheduled to be created. So bottom line, it seems to me that manufacturing is uh, is not the entire answer. Now, I'm not ruling out manufacturing as a place for India to go. We don't need to be overly pessimistic. There will be areas where India will succeed. For example, already, we are finding that, uh, you know, Indian motorcycles, Royal Enfield motorcycle, is being sold in the land of the Harley-Davidson. That's a success. We're even finding that Indian whiskey is being sold in Scotland. That's worth celebrating. We're actually doing stuff which is high quality. There will also be areas where improved infrastructure and logistics, as well as as we improve the training of our labor force, will make India competitive. And certainly, our tremendous advantage in agriculture. We have, you know, some of you may not know it, more arable area than China has. And we have a strong agricultural presence, and productivity is increasing. Agri-industry will be a big source of employment for our people and will exploit our increasing agricultural productivity. And, and finally, uh, one of our advantages today is that a lot of companies in democratic countries don't trust China. So we are being seen as one of the countries that offers a China plus one alternative. We are seeing some manufacturing come to India uh, Apple is an example most recently. But there is a limit to all this. Increasingly, you're seeing protectionism in manufacturing in a number of industrial countries. Uh, you are seeing uh, many countries uh, reluctant to accept that there will be a manufacturing giant following on China. They were very wary of having given up their manufacturing to China. So protectionism is really on the rise in, in manufacturing. And it is that when we recognize all that, that we should uh, start thinking about what has been our strength. And that's why the first charts I put forward, that services has always, always been the more important employer in India. And technology has now opened up fantastic new opportunities in services. So what I'm going to talk about in the next few minutes is not so much that we should give up trying to get better in manufacturing. By all means, we should do what we can, improve our logistics, improve the ease of doing business, and focus, perhaps, on creating high-skilled manufacturing. But the bus left the stop quite a while back. 
and the world is not prepared for that bus to go very far. So rather than try chasing after the manufacturing bus, let's not miss the services bus, which is something we can take today. So why do I say services? Let me start by talking about producer services. That's the one that employs higher skilled workers to offer services to other producers, things like banking, things like IT services, and so on. Um, a while ago, a friend uh, who's a senior partner in an accounting firm told me that she was moving back to India to run European support operations. I said, that's fantastic. So you're running the back office for Europe? And she said, no. Not only are Indians really very qualified, with video technology, they can present directly to clients. So we no, no longer call it the back office. In fact, they're part of the front office. It's just that they don't deal physically with clients. They do deal virtually with clients making presentations. They just happen to be located somewhere else. In other words, what the pandemic has done is it allowed work at a distance in the United States. A consultant could work from home in Chicago and service clients in Austin. But that raises a question, why can't that consultant work in Kotagiri, a small town in the Nilgiri Hills, uh, thus spreading economic activity away from the West into the rest of the, into the, rest of the world, but even within India, away from the big cities into the more rural, uh, semi-rural areas. Uh, nothing stops that. Uh, so long as you have the capabilities, so long as you have the connectivity, you can perform that kind of work. And, and services delivered online, unlike physical goods, don't cross a physical barrier where they can be stopped. Now, undoubtedly, there is tremendous protectionism in services. Uh, it is uh, a very protected area, which also means that it is an area where a little liberalization can go a long way in creating more opportunities. And one reason that liberalization can happen is the West is today the largest exporter of services. You hear constantly, India is a big exporter of services. It is one of the top 10. But this world's single largest exporter of services is the United States. And services like consulting, like uh, financial services, like legal services, which it has exports around the world. We can ride on their coattails if there is a global willingness to uh, liberalize services and provide services across the world, including to the United States. Uh, so that's, that's what I want to talk about a little more. Why does India have an advantage? I talked about our disadvantages in manufacturing relative to some of our competitors. What are our advantages in providing services? Start first with the language we're speak that I'm speaking in, the English language. We have adopted the language of the colonial power and made it our own. Now, while obviously there is a need for us to be conversant in our mother tongue, history has given us an advantage that neither China nor Vietnam have, the ability to speak in the global tongue. So far from driving out English from our schools, our politicians must make sure that every child can learn in English and speak in English so that they can participate in the global market. That's advantage number one. Second, we have people like you. We have a large number of very highly qualified graduates with fantastic universities like the IITs, the IITs, the ISCs, the IIMs, and the NITs, many universities, uh, with a lot of very strong graduates. Now, I'm not saying that we are uniformly good, and I'll come back to that later. We need to do a lot more on higher education, but we have uh, people at the frontiers, and it's always been a pleasure working with these highly qualified graduates. I can attest to the caliber of, uh, of people like you uh, and the reputation you have in the rest of the world, which leads me to my third point. India already has a high reputation for high quality services. Qualified Indians across the world have built that reputation. Um, you know, for example, uh, if, you're, if you look relatively prosperous in the US and you're Indian, everybody thinks you're a doctor because our doctors have done so much 
in, uh, in, in, in expanding uh, the vision of India. Of course, uh, we have uh, other very, very capable people. Satya Nadella, for example, uh, uh, you know, is, is somebody that uh, conveys the India brand across uh, the United States, gives a respectability which, uh, which Indian firms can build on. We also have a very strong technology base, and that's another uh, positive, especially when you're thinking of uh, providing services at a distance. Uh, Nanda Nilekani uh, did wonders in building out the uh, Aadhaar stack. We can build a lot of domestic services on that basis, but we can also give advice to the rest of the world on how they can uh, build their service business. But the last two elements I want to come to uh, um, uh, in our strengths are elements that typically we don't talk about. One, we have a largely independent judiciary and we have a liberal democracy. Why do I think these are important? These are important in the world of exporting services because the provider has to be trusted, especially in the use of the data that they harvest. This automatically puts a number of countries like China and Russia, authoritarian countries, at a disadvantage. Today, TikTok, for example, operates in the US. A number of politicians want to limit its operations because even though it's incorporated in the US now, as a result of pressure from Congress, nobody trusts the fact that TikTok will not send back data to China and thereby get some kind of ability to pressurize individuals in the US based on what they put online. More broadly, no customer or no country cares where their citizens are buying a vacuum cleaner so long as it works well, right? Vacuum cleaner is fire and forget. Maybe you need spare parts, but it doesn't keep uh, retaining a memory of who you are, what you are, what you do, etc. But if they're asked to share their medical or financial data or their firm strategy, they care very much where they get it from. They want to know that the protector will protect their data, not just from other competitors, but also from their government. They want to make sure the government doesn't snoop or use the data for blackmail. So it helps if the provider comes from a democracy where the government is bound by rule of law. There's a trust that emerges from that relationship, a trust that is not necessary in manufacturing exports, a trust that is much more necessary in service exports where data are important. Now, a final reason for why it makes sense to focus on producer services, especially as we export them, is that there is a limit to how much the world can grow based on the consumption of goods because of the devastating effect on the climate. The world has to grow green, which means more of the consumption basket. You see it as countries grow, grow richer, more of the consumption basket increasingly consists of services, even in moderate income countries. Indeed, if you look at the last decade, service exports in the world have grown much faster than global goods exports. And that's yet another reason, if we are thinking decades ahead, and we have to think decades ahead when we're thinking of Indian growth, it makes much more sense for India to lay its eggs in the service basket rather than in the manufacturing basket. So that leads to the question, what do we need to do on the global stage to succeed? And service exports will not be easy. We need to bring down global protectionist barriers. But if we start focusing on it, there's so much we can do. For instance, if we want to provide telemedicine, and telemedicine increasingly is something that is becoming more effective. Uh, during the pandemic, it increased by leaps and bounds because it was difficult to meet in person. But in order to provide telemedicine from Bangalore to, say, uh, uh, New York, you need Indian degrees to be recognized internationally. And of course, nobody recognizes uh, degrees from elsewhere, and that's the inherent protectionism that exists in the global environment. But can we push for international uh, certification exams? Uh, can we push for them to be made easily available across the world? I mean, the United Kingdom has a national health service which is completely clogged. It cannot provide services to its people in finite time. Why doesn't it make sense for them to start buying in services from the rest of the world? 
Now, one of the reasons it's impossible for an outside provider to provide to some of these, these countries is they don't allow insurance to pay outside providers. So in addition to recognizing outside degrees, we could also push for insurance payments to be made more globally. But these are things we have to agitate for. India is now the president of the G20. Rather than focusing only on issues of manufacturing protectionism, which are going to be hard to reverse, given the concerns in many industrial countries, can we start reducing some of the barriers to services so as to enable our companies, which have already shown massive abilities to provide services, to allow them to compete internationally? Think, for example, of the kinds of partnerships that could emerge. For example, Cleveland Clinic, well-known, reputable, uh, you know, hospital in the United States has expanded in, in, in some parts of the world, but if they could employ Indian doctors to, aff uh, to offer medical services uh, in the rest of the world, with the reputation of Clean Cleveland Clinic sort of opening doors, we could start the process. And then eventually Indian providers would emerge, a Dr. Reddy's lab providing those services globally. We need to think big. We need to think differently and then we can really do much more. Now, of course, um, we need to do much more domestically also to increase job growth. And it's not just going to come from doctors or designers providing services to the rest of the world. Many of our people don't have the capabilities to provide high quality services. So part of our agenda for future growth has to be to enhance the quality of our human capital. That itself can be an enormous investment project because it can generate employment in education and skill building services, in healthcare services, in financial inclusion services. There's a whole set of employment possibilities. Take, for example, higher education. I said I'd come back to this. In, as, as we just argued, in many skilled services, our youth, people like you, need just a recognized uh, degree and a trustworthy employer to serve the rest of the world. That's all you need. And many of you will graduate from IIT, go work for Goldman or go work for McKinsey, and immediately enter the uh, global labor market. But for that, we need many more people to go through the IITs. I, I looked at the numbers. It's, it's uh, a little alarming. There are 23 IITs in India which admit about 16,000 students. That's about 1%, I know you know these numbers because you've been through this, that's about 1% of those who write advanced JE, right, 1%. That admission rate um, is perhaps the most selective in the world. Even if we had four times the number of IITs, we would still be below the admission rate for Harvard, Yale, and Princeton. And that's, that's, that's worrisome. That is suggestive that we need many more high quality universities and technical institutions. So education, if we expand it appropriately, can provide a lot of jobs. Of course, the key problem in many educational institutions is getting faculty. And that's where, again, high quality institutions like IIT can provide uh, the, uh, the output of training the teachers who will go into many other universities. But along with, uh, uh, with actual institutions of, uh, of education which are physical, there are also a lot of ed tech companies which are creating many jobs for software assisted tutors. So take the universities, take the ed tech companies, and you see very quickly that there's a lot of employment here. But each of these good jobs itself creates four or five jobs for the less skilled. Every school, university, or ed tech platform has not only jobs for the teachers, designers, and tutors, but also for clerical staff, for coaches, for cooks, for cleaners, for ground staff, and security guards. And so we see an ecosystem which builds around these high quality jobs of moderate quality jobs. Now this is important. You may say, oh, this creates inequality, et cetera. It does, initially. But if we can give these people a way to move up, you can steadily increase the quality of the labor force. Let me give an example. At, at the RBI, when I was there, we used to have an uh, annual dinner 
for the uh, class four employees. Class four is a, is a term which includes people like the pewns, the, uh, the uh, sweepers, and people like that. It was amazing to see the kids of these class four employees. The kids were in Infosys, were bank managers, were, uh, uh, were um, you know, had uh, very high quality jobs. Why did they have those jobs? Because their parents, even though not rich, could afford to put them in decent schools. From those decent schools, they went to decent colleges, and then they just jumped in one generation from being at the bottom rung of the urban, uh, um, uh, of urban India to getting to the top rung. Education does that for you. And my sense is that if we create decent jobs, we can create much better jobs for people over time as we expand the possibilities in education. Now, um, these are just some of the things that can happen if we create a strong education sector. But I want to say that, you know, uh, there are possibilities in many areas. And just to emphasize, I mean, think about our, our unicorns there. Where have the unicorns emerged? Our unicorns, if you look at this list, uh, and I don't know if you can read it, but really, they emerged without an enormous amount of government support, without production-linked incentives. Many of them are in services. If you just look at the choice these entrepreneurs have made of where they go, that suggests where India's comparative advantage is. It's not in manufacturing. These guys are not going to manufacturing. They're going to services in a big way. Now, add to the kinds of jobs these entrepreneurs are producing, add to that more traditional consumer services like retail, hospitality, travel, and tourism, all of which tend to be very employment intensive and employ all kinds of people, not just the ones with very high skills. And I would argue then that offers us the possibility of a different growth model, of a country that transitions from agriculture directly to services without going through manufacturing. Now, there are a number of, uh, of uh, academics, like Professor Danny Roderick of Harvard, who call this premature deindustrialization. I would argue that it is possible that premature deindustrialization is not a bug, but a feature of India's growth path. That this may be the way we actually grow rich, not through the manufacturing route, but through the services route. Now, uh, let me uh, end by sort of saying, does this mean a two-tier India? Does it mean people like you getting great jobs and people outside not doing so well? And I would argue, as I said earlier, we need to focus on ensuring every Indian eventually has a chance at high-skilled jobs, which means we have to ensure everyone has capabilities, we have to improve their access to opportunities, and both these require a learning and responsive government. So let's start first with ensuring everyone has capabilities. Now, to get the best from our talent, we have to give everyone a fair chance. And this means starting from our biggest minority, which is women, and including religious minorities like Muslims and disadvantaged castes and tribes. Now, it's important not just to give them a fair chance at, at opportunities, but also to treat everybody equally. Because a discriminating society is not just immoral, it is weak because it is internally divided. History tells us that any minority treated as a second class citizen will not stay docile in the face of oppressive behavior. And that does not bode well for the long term uh, future of a country. So equal treatment of all is not appeasement. It is the right and sensible thing to do. Second, because inequality starts early, we must put more resources in early education, in healthcare, and safety nets for the weakest. So those are things we need to do to bring everybody up. We need to do more of it. We also need to improve access to opportunity, and that means uh, improving the quality and access of our markets. So as people gain more capabilities, we need to give them the chance to use them. For example, uh, we need to improve access to markets, to the ability to create jobs for yourself through self-employment, and to the ability to get formal jobs. 
When we pave a road to a village, it does wonders for the village economy because overnight, your dairy farmer suddenly finds a market. They can send milk to the city and that gives them much more in terms of earning power. They can send chicken to the city, again giving them much more earning power. And as they get more earning power, stop, uh, you see shops starting up within the village. You see the shops stocking the latest goods. You see development happening, happening before your eyes as people take charge. So what we need to do is give them that opportunity by creating their access to markets. And access to markets today doesn't just mean physical connectivity, it also means virtual connectivity, that they have the ability to access online markets. And this also means we must make it much easier to open businesses and to protect businesses from harassment by the inspectorate. Uh, give you an example, I mean, we've heard all this talk about doing business has been made more easy. But for the ordinary entrepreneur, it is still very, very difficult. I met a, uh, a, a hotel keeper in, in the Nilgiris the other day, and uh, that person had just taken over the hotel his, his father had built and was running it, and said, I really want to open new hotels, but I don't know what permissions I need and where I have to go to get those permissions, and I'm very scared that if I, if I open a new hotel, some inspector will show up and say, what are all these things that you haven't done? So rather than do that, I might as well take the hotel that my father had and work with it rather than uh, opening anything new. So this is actually not out of the ordinary in India. There are a lot of people who could become entrepreneurs, but because of the difficulty of opening and maintaining a business, uh, they prefer to take more steady uh, jobs. So technology can help here. The kinds of work that you, uh, many of you do could help ease the way towards opening new businesses to eliminate corruption. Uh, one example where technology has reduced corruption significantly is in the passport office. Many of you will be going for passports one of these days. And it used to be in our time, it was incredibly difficult to get a passport because there were various hurdles which were opaque. And of course, there was an implicit requirement that, uh, that the person on the other side wanted gratification to move your file forward. As we've made it much more transparent through technology, you've reduced the level of corruption significantly. So that perhaps the only point where you have corruption nowadays is when the policeman comes to verify whether you stay at the place uh, where you purport to stay. So uh, that brings me to the most important change. We have to change government, uh, the way we govern. Because if, uh, even if a government buys into this agenda, its provision of goods like education and healthcare is often deficient because it's unresponsive to local or individual needs. And I'm talking not just about the central government, but also state governments. So how do we get a understanding and responsive government? Today, even an uh, Indian state like Uttar Pradesh has nearly 200 million people. Now think of that number, 200 million people. That's two thirds the size of the United States. The United States has 50 states. One state in India accounts for two-thirds of the size of the United States. How can a functionary who's sitting in Lucknow possibly formulate policy for every remote village? So we need much more decentralization of government to make it much more responsive to people, which means devolving functions, funds, and functionaries, not just from the center to the states, much of which uh, you know, is embedded in our constitution, but from the states to the municipalities to the panchayats so that they have some real power, they can actually affect policy. I'll give you an example here. Supposing a teacher doesn't show up to the village school, there is actually very little the village can do about that teacher because the teacher is paid by the state capital and is part of a unionized whole there. If, on the other hand, they had some ability to affect the terms of employment of the teacher, maybe even suspend them if they didn't show up to the village school, then village parents would have much more of an effect on the teaching that happens in the school. Decentralization will help a lot in empowering our people and give them much 
a much greater ability to affect their capability building. Now, another place where government can be made more responsive is we, if we place more weight on individual rights and freedoms and push courts to enforce them. Now, this is important because it is something that you know, we've talked about in the past, we've never done. Recently, we've seen the weaponization of central institutions like the Enforcement Directorate and the CBI against critics, including most recently the BBC. Central and state authorities routinely suppress local critics and prevent change using draconian acts like UAPA and the Sedition Law. Section 295A of the Indian Penal Code is often used to oppress certain communities and suppress free speech. Now, there is a reason why these acts are in place. They were meant to protect the public from criminals and terrorists, but they also open the door for tremendous misuse against uh, you know, the broader public, those who stand up and protest. They protect, in a sense, the lazy, the incompetent, and the corrupt in government from the public and enable the government to hound those it doesn't like. This has to change. If we want a functioning democracy, if we want government to be responsible uh, to the public, if we want the public to be able to determine the kinds of services it gets, it has to have the right to protest. And that right to protest, democratic protest, I'm not talking about burning buses, I'm talking about constitutionally protected uh, protest, that has to be uh, preserved. And, and, and finally, uh, I would argue, you know, uh, we should make use of our democracy if we want to expand the kinds of services we provide. For example, can't we, as a country, enact privacy laws based on the best global practices, which allow Indian firms to assure domestic and international users that their data will be safe and protected from misuse both by the firm, but also unwarranted surveillance by the Indian government. Not only will this protect civil rights domestically, it will also be a big boon for our firms because they can use that kind of law to say that your data are safe with us. And we are India, we have a judiciary which will protect you uh, even if uh, you believe that the government can be intrusive. So last point, and I will, I will end here, uh, you know, I've talked about decentralization, I've talked about checks and balances on the government, I've talked about laws which make the, uh, you know, protect the citizen. But the final point we have to have is a government that learns by experimentation. One of the big successes in China was it experimented, that before rolling out a policy, tried it on a small scale, tried it in different places, learned what the problems were, and then rolled it out on a big scale. Well, we tend not to do that. We do policy by jhatta. One, you know, somebody at the center decides on the spur of the moment, uh, you know, this is good, and, and the nation sort of has to bear the cost. So that's something we should, we should eschew, especially as we get uh, to be, you know, we're a three trillion economy, we're a complex economy. It is very hard to run a complex economy by the seat of the pants. You have to have more reasoned debate. You have to have more inputs by experts. You have to have more uh, sort of reasonable decision making based on data. At least to a related point, we need data. Often we don't know how the economy is doing because either nobody collects the data or because data collection was suppressed. I mean, take for example COVID. How many deaths were there, were there really there in COVID? Um, you know, many um, outside uh, sources based not on real data but on, on extrapolation say perhaps the level of COVID deaths was 10 times what we see. Now, of course, if we had good data, we would know, but we don't. And so the debate goes on. Similarly, unemployment. We have no idea what the level of unemployment in India is because we don't collect the data carefully. So more data analysis more critical decision, uh, critical analysis based on the data which then can inform the government will be good. Often, you know, governments think by suppressing criticism they're better off. In fact, they're much worse off because nobody tells them when they're going off track and they can go seriously off track without knowing. We need government which is informed by data, by analysis, by careful decision making. And I would argue a liberal democracy 
offers the best environment to have a learning and responsive government, which is my last point. So, in sum, let me conclude, I've taken too long. Um, we need an Indian growth path that draws on the capabilities of all Indians and builds on India's historic culture of tolerance and respect for all. It will draw on India's traditional liberalism, not just the fact that we have regular elections, but the fact that from Vedic times, the argumentative Indian can debate and criticize that she can have ideas that are diametrically opposite to that of the government. So preserving liberal democracy will improve the quality of India's ideas and governance and make India trusted by citizens elsewhere in the world. And that's what we need to have explosive growth in the kinds of things that we can offer the world. So India can become a Vishwa Guru, not just on the basis of the ideas of the past, but because it has a new vision of green, inclusive, local-led growth and development, and persuades the world of it by showing that it works. This path is not going to be easy, but it is a basis for a manifesto for change. In our 75th year of independence, I do believe India's best days lie ahead. But we have lots of work to do to make it so. Let me stop. Thanks. Yeah, 
staying at home uh, and to do all the good stuff. I went abroad and, uh, and then, you know, uh, I, I got caught up in all that. I've always wanted to uh, certainly come back and do something. I think the government gave me a chance with the um, Chief Economic Advisor and then the RBI. That was uh, probably the uh, most uh, fulfilling experience. I, I, I would say the RBI, you know, first there were lots of young people there, and uh, I, I've always found it very refreshing. As an academic, but uh, even as an administrator, to deal with other people because they're so full of enthusiasm. And, and they, you know, uh, they, you said them anything, they work really hard to get it done. And, and that was my experience with the other day with the young, young people who were there. Um, you know, they're not jaded by life. And that's so important to be, to be enthusiastic about the possibilities, even when you can manage. I think naivety is actually quite important because it makes you take up challenges which other people would say are impossible. And, and sometimes it happens. Sometimes you succeed in those challenges. So, so my, my sort of hope is not to become cynical before you back. Don't be cynical. It's all too easy to say the system is bad, this is corrupt, this is, this is not going to work. Be enthusiastic and happy. Now, uh, the other question is that when I'm coming back, I keep coming back. Uh, I'm actually working in the university in South Korea University. We're trying to create, uh, I mean, I said we need hundreds of universities of the quality of our We're trying to set up one which has, you know, uh, uh, which, which hopefully will be, will be a very good one. But we need many more. Uh, and so I do a bit of work there, and uh, my good friend, Amit Shah, Sabir, is crazy. Why do we come back and, and speak uh, to, again, some talk with the brief that was very kind to be here. So, yeah, I keep coming back. Uh, politics, I, you know, I, I'm not going to get these babies, so... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't know how much babies. I don't know how much babies, but I don't know how much babies. Um, 
you know, continuously dismissing it as some sort of colonial view and their colonial past, etc., when such blogging comes in India, people say, oh, we're shouting back at the US. But that's, you know, that's neither here nor there. The real issue is, what is good for us? And what is good for us is, let's listen to our viewpoints and then decide what are our, our, our pathway forward is. Let's not just import something from somewhere and say that's going to be good. But let's also not just reject it because it comes from elsewhere, because it's not invented here. And, and that confidence, I mean, in a sense, we've got to jettison the colonial past. We've got to jettison this view that we're always, a, you know, I mean, look, I've worked in, in uh, Western organizations, I was in the IMF, uh, and I fought against this, this old view, oh, the West knows, and I've tried to say, we need to have a view which is right, and sometimes those old views are wrong. I've uh, fought battles against the Federal Reserve for years and years, saying that they have a wrong view about free policy. But at the same time, I think it should be legit. It should be, because they're saying it, they're wrong. You have to have a sense of why they're wrong and show them that they're wrong. And this is where I think we need to develop our own capabilities. India, you know, I, I hope we do it in the G20 presidency. We have got our agenda. Here is our view for growth. Here is how it is different. We should stop constantly just rejecting that agenda without offering a plan of our own. And I hope this presidency of the G20 will do that. Here's a agenda for sustainable world growth. Right? Interesting, you're wrong, you, you have to look at the world, you have done all that. It's one world we live in. What is our plan? And how is our plan going to take the world forward? So we need more thinking. That's where people like you come in. You have to be the people who provide the ideas to the world from India. Here are our ideas. Here is how they're different, here is how they're better. They will certainly come from an Indian perspective, they may be biased towards India, but at least it offers us an alternative rather than just rejecting what the West says and says we don't buy into that. Um, what was the other question? Um, I don't really want to pass the population control to your question, but changes in the educational system, like yeah. if you want to. Well, I mean, look, I, I, I think we have a lot of uh, really top quality educational institutions. Where we need much more change is in primary and secondary education to improve the quality uh, of education that, uh, that kids, especially from a poorer section, from rural areas, the kind of education they get. In a sense, the education system is a big equalizer. And if we can improve that quality at, at lower levels, the lower levels will be back. If you've been through a poor primary school, you're going to have a miserable secondary school education. And if you even pass that, you're going to have an awful college education. So you need to improve the quality right from the bottom. And that is even before you get into school. Uh, earlier, uh, you know, in your early, uh, my colleague Jim Heckman, a Nobel laureate uh, in, in the 80s, uh, in the early 90s, uh, basically says by age five or nine, you're set for life. If you had terrible food, if you had bad, uh, you know, values in injected into your parents, uh, you're, you're finished at uh, age five. I think it's been a little, a little uh, sort of overdramatic, but it does suggest that early capabilities are very, very important. Whether you have good nutrition, whether you uh, get the right vaccines against disease, whether you've, uh, you've even learned uh, basic uh, uh, value systems. Those are very important. And we should do our best to get that to everyone. Yeah, and I actually think he's not exaggerating. This is stuff that I've worked on. And there's a lot of medical literature which says that the child's nutritional mass is set before the age of five, which is why it's important to give them eggs in other varieties, which the government is Sorry. Well, I, 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 you know, that's the wonder. We always have experts to know. So, absolutely. Sorry, I never no, I, 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 I didn't think I had anything to do, so I will just withdraw my exaggerated or whatever comment I made about it. Okay, okay. So, there's any questions about So, I mean, on demonetization, I've 
spoken before, I, I, I think uh, I was asked about whether uh, we should go for it. I, I uh, basically tried to persuade the government it was a bad idea. Uh, I was uh, not required to make a decision because uh, we were just, uh, in a sense, preparing for a possibility. Uh, and uh, we certainly started, I, I didn't want to be in the position that we had a point where demonetization was decided and we had no money. I knew that it would take a long, long time to, to print the money that we needed to make sure it didn't kill our economy. And so we started the printing of the money that would be needed if there was a decision. If there wasn't, this would just be, uh, you know, new money that was infused into and 12 million notes were withdrawn. So we were prepared. Uh, we never reached the full preparation that we needed. And that is why we had a huge shortage of cash as we did the demonetization. That's an example of a decision I think could have been, unfortunately, nature of demonetization means it has to be a small group of people who know, but it could have been much better debated and thought out, and it was not. Then there's a bunch of questions on the global recession and Forces, right? And the latest uh, import export numbers suggest that our imports uh, have been falling. That suggests weakness in the domestic economy, but our exports have also been not doing, uh, not doing well. So we are going to be affected by ebbs and flows of the global economy. Now, that said, uh, I think the global economy, everybody has been predicting recession, but it hasn't happened. And in fact, the latest numbers from the US are that it is reasonably, still reasonably strong. Um, la, la, just a tidbit uh, for those of you who are interested in, uh, in economics. You know, the last jobs number in the U.S. said there were 500,000 plus jobs that have been created, right? It actually is not 500,000 jobs that were created in the U.S. In January, the U.S. lost two and a half million jobs. However, the jobs number that puts out that is put out is a seasonally adjusted job number. So typically in January, jobs go down. There are lots of firings that happen in, in January. This time, it didn't go down as much as it typically does. So it looked like there's an addition of 500,000 jobs. It looks like employers are providing all these new jobs. It turns out it just fired fewer people than they did in the past. So in, in two and a half million people job loss. It's just a statistical quirk. For those of you who are interested, uh, it might be useful to look at those things. So last question, because we are over time. Uh, you spoke about crony capitalism being a driver of China's growth. You see elements of the same in India. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Look, uh, I think it's very important for a country like ours to have a level playing field for everyone which means that everyone should be able to open businesses to have them flourish, <coughs> that certain groups shouldn't have privileged access and protection from the government in whatever business, that certain groups shouldn't have the ability to buy businesses on a, you know, when others aren't allowed, uh, that the Competition Commission has to be an effective authority which makes sure that no business dominates any area of the economy. And I think this means we need institutional progress. We need to strengthen our institutions, our regulators like SEBI, like the RBI, but also we need strong new institutions. The Competition Commission for a while looked like it would be strong, but I haven't seen it raise too much of the questions that need to be raised in India. Are we getting adequate competition within the economy? If you have a strong competition commission backed up by the judicial authorities, we will not have the kind of crony capitalism that we worry about across the world. So we need to do more on that, obviously. Okay, so as promised, we let you go. <laughs> well, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure coming back to you. Thank you.